That, of course, is the great Paul McCartney. Welcome to Expert Minutes. Welcome I'm John Hambone McGuire. Sweet, juicy. Where did that word come from? I don't know. You never thought you'd hear that on the radio. Anna Wheeling, where are you? Hi, I'm in Glasgow at the moment. I'm sitting in my flat, um, sunny outside. And yeah, I've kind of banished my flatmates away from the living room for 40 minutes or so while we have this okay. conversation. Okay. Yeah. And you don't sound Glaswegian. No, I'm from the Highlands. I am Scottish. Um, I grew up in near Inverness and uh, came down to the Central Belt to study. But my parents are both English, so that's why I have a... English accent or semi-English accent. Some people in England think I sound Scottish, but... Oh, really? So have you lived in England? No, never. Wow, because you don't have a... To me, you don't even have a hint of the of the Scottish lilt at all. No, at all. I think it comes differently. My accent's very different when I'm talking to different people. So if I'm talking... Okay. If I'm trying to talk properly, I sound a lot more English. And then if I go to a kind of pub in, like on like, you know, Great Western Road somewhere, then I, the Scottishness comes out a bit more. <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up just outside Liverpool. All my family are from Liverpool. And I find if I get angry and start swearing, I sound scouse. Yeah. Um, I think you that, sound get away with it. You do? Bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've, I, I left there when I was uh, 18 and lived in New Zealand for mm. seven years. And then I lived in Australia for another six and a half. So I was out of the country for nearly 15 years yeah. so uh it's amazing that there's something there i think it's a bit mixed up though i think there's a bit yeah. of Aussie in there as well yeah now you said aussie in new zealand now that's what you sound like so <laughs> it's, it's really confusing so how did you get into podcasting well it was definitely a result of the lockdown um i've always been you know into podcasts especially radio um listening to podcasts and stuff um, since I was like a 14 year old, maybe. Um, but I didn't think about making work, audio work at all until the lockdown hit and uh, there wasn't any options for making film or theatre for a while. So I was like, well, I still want to write, I still want to make work, um, I still want to work with artists and create something together and audio seemed like a really good way to do that and I think that was a common story with a lot of artists um, and people working especially in theatre um, I know there's been other podcasts I've heard that have come out from theatre companies and to, to varying degrees of success some are better some are worse but I think it's a really interesting medium and that you can use creatively if you're kind of it's good to think outside the box in audio yeah so yeah. So, so the the lockdown changed your life changed your direction I think so. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's safe to say with most people. But yeah, it definitely got me much more connected with my own creativity, especially yeah. in audio. And yeah, um, started a new path, I guess, which is nice. Yeah, it changed my life. Before lockdown, I was in radio for 25 years, starting out in Australia on the air as a presenter or a, a disc jockey. And uh I had a few jobs as program directors at different stations and I ended up working at a station in London who fired me just before lockdown. Wow. And then lockdown came and no one would even interview for jobs. And I was like, I'm in trouble now. So I had to work out how to make a living from home. And so I discovered audiobooks and I narrate audiobooks now. I've got about 120 of them on sale at Audible and I make more money from that than I ever did in radio. Wow. So... You know, it's horrible. I mean, the the pandemic is a horrible thing, but it's the best thing, one of the best yeah. things that's ever happened to me. Yeah. And I think that's like audio books for me is definitely how I came into audio in general and radio and podcasting. There's a guy that does a podcast called the Classic Tales Podcast. Yeah. Which is uh, he, same sort of thing. He just reads audio books. And yeah. I, I think he started out when podcasting was like really new. He's been doing it for years and years and years. And um, yeah, that was the first podcast I ever encountered, and it was a it was reading audiobooks. 
So, so, so in the podcast, does he read audiobooks or does he talk about the business of reading uh, he, audiobooks? He, like, he write, will read like a classic tale. So he'll read Dr. Oh, okay. Jacqueline Mr. Hyde. And, okay. you know, put on all That's the That's clever because they're all out of, out of copyright. Dickens yeah, exactly, and yeah. Sherlock Holmes and all that stuff. There's a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of stuff that you could just pick up and read. And it's like amazing because, well, personally, I'm dyslexic but I love stories. So yeah. reading, I do read and like, I'm not as, you know, I managed to get through university doing a literature degree. Um, and it's well done. Fun, but reading is always really slow for me. And I don't, I get it. I find it quite frustrating. So I always wanted to engage in classic literature and it's right there. Like someone reading it to you. Well, and what's you the name of that well, podcast? Cause I think I'd like that. What, what's it called? Yeah, it's called the classic tales podcast um classic tales podcast okay. an american man called bj harrison who mm -hmm. reads it and he yeah he's so so he's reading it in a kind of american accent but he he puts on all these different voices for different characters and it's quite it's like high enough quality um that you're like this is engaging so yeah yeah i've done books in american accents i've done i've done books in so many accents i've done books in geordie I've done Scottish books. I did one called The History of Scotland. I did in a in a Scottish accent, the whole thing. Come on, you and, have to uh, give a Scottish accent, though. No, oh, well, I, it, for this book, I mean, I did it kind of posh jock, like maybe Edinburgh, I don't know, because it's, cause it's yeah. for Americans. So so I did it a bit like that, and I talked about Robert the Bruce and things like that, you know, and I just did the whole book in that accent. Yeah. Very Morningside, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Now, you're the creative producer of The Positive. Now, this is how I found out about you, is I, what was it? Somebody sent me a thing and said, can you review this for, I forget what they wanted a review for. I don't even know why they, I forget who it was now, and I don't even know why they sent it to me, probably because I'm on podcast radio and I host the Pod 20. I don't know. And yeah. They sent me this and said, would you listen to it and review it? And I listened to it and I was blown away. It was really, really good. So I gave a really nice review and thanked them. And then I said, well, if look, somebody involved in this would like to be on podcast radio and talk about it. Um, mm. So it's called The Positive. We'll find out yeah. more about it as we go along. You're the, you, the creative producer of The Positive. It's by Baker Street Productions, who I know you're not involved with anymore. But what does a creative producer do? So The Positive is one episode of actually a bigger series. Um, the series is called Spaces, and we worked with, it's got five episodes in the series. So as creative producer, my role was to oversee the whole of that series. So The Positive is one episode, and there's actually many more that you can listen to, um, all written by emerging writers. And I kind of just- All different writers for each one? Different writers for each one, yeah. yeah. Um, dealing with different subjects, but all based around the idea that the stories should be set in one space. So that was my concept. I came up with this idea of, of having a series, an audio series of like narrative based podcasts that were, were had this kind of feeling of always being in one space. And it was a, really a direct like response to the lockdown and people always being in the same space. And how do you bring stories and, and really theater um, narrative to somebody when they can't go elsewhere? So we try and bring them to that in a kind of sound rich environment. So the positive is written um, about it's the story is written in a really specific bathroom, like opposite outside of Cayley Hall, which is a really Scottish thing. And it's a Scottish story. But there's other uh, episodes in the series. Um, I actually wrote one myself and that's set all in a bath. Um, there's one that's set in a car. There's one that's set in a corridor of a house. And they all, so they all have really different, like sound rich environments. And that was the kind of brief that I went to writers to and, and found writers and said, do you want to write with this idea in mind? And yeah, so I kind of, as creative producer, I kind of oversaw the whole project, um, finding the writers, coming up with the concepts, leading the writers through all of these different workshops. We kind of wrote them from scratch, peer supported, um, and then, finding actors going through the the recording process working with sound designers in the post-production and kind of having a trying to trying to find a full feel to the piece we also worked with a amazing composer called rosie wilson who uh composed a score for like each 
episode, but also trying to find that kind of musicality throughout all of them and create a full series. So there's like quite a kind of creative arc over the whole thing. And I kind of was to oversee all of that, but I did it with like everyone, you know, I always had an amazing, um, amazing production manager called Kirsty Fraser, who was like overseeing all of that as well from a logistical perspective. So having being a creative producer, you're kind of like creativity, but also management. Um, and it's quite a hard line to to walk. And I don't think I could have done it without Kirsty's help, especially. And yeah, and with all the input from all the amazing creative people that worked on it. So you need to uh, engage the left brain and the right brain, the creative side, yeah. an, side and the analytical side. To, to use a yeah. very old reference, the Kirk and the Spock. You needed exactly. both. <laughs> yeah, it's an ego. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and so what's the full series called then? So it's called Spaces. Is Spaces really is the name. Called. So I've got a lot to catch up on because I've only heard one, yeah. which is the positive. One. Yeah, oh, and, and that I wasn't aware of. And that's, you know, that's the shame of podcasting is there's so much great stuff out there, but the discovery is the challenge, which is yeah. what hopefully podcast radio is helping with because we're an actual on the air radio station and all we do is play podcasts yeah. uh, and we're on DAB in London. We're on in Manchester. We're on in Glasgow too. And we're also online, but we're on DAB in those cities. So do you think that is a good idea for a radio station? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the, one of the roles that I was trying to grapple with as well being the creative producer is like how where this goes like what are you making who are you making it for yeah you know you have to start thinking about that when you're thinking about a project um and it's podcasting is amazing because you have so much flexibility to create anything and put it out on the airwaves but then <laughs> counter to that you also need to find your audience and finding yeah. your audience is harder so we we actually did prior to this i did another series with baker street um which was our kind of pilot one, which is a similar sort of idea. We're working with new writers, um, finding you know new creative voices in the industry. Uh, we made six plays. Um, they were all based around women's issues, and they went out just like free on Spotify. That was our yeah. first kind of test to see if that was interesting. We entered them into a few kind of radio festivals. One of them was picked up on BBC uh, Scotland, BBC Radio Scotland, which was great. But this, I'm pretty sure, like I say, I'm not working for Big Street Productions anymore, so I'm actually not sure what the distribution model of spaces is at the moment. But I know that it's going out to festivals like arts festivals. Um, and I, as far as I'm aware, it's not freely available. So there's that. That's a different kind okay. of distribution model, yeah. which means we're trying to get a bit of money back from it, basically, and say, you know, we put a lot of effort into this. We need to get some some money back which is a lot of the ways that you know theater works is that they'll make a show and they'll put it in a venue and you have to pay tickets to come and see the venue which is i think the model that baker street productions is going on at the moment but it's this kind of counterintuitive and thing that you feel people feel like they should be able to listen to podcasts for free but how do you make work for free and yeah and how do you make sure that people are listening to your work so yeah it's definitely a tension that i think podcasting is amazing and has a lot of potential but yeah. finding that audience is always going to be really hard so, so yeah. how did you what you said you started out listening to podcasts yeah. how did you originally find out about them because my journey to them was i was a radio presenter and i had a daily breakfast show which is like if you've ever done daily breakfast radio it just eats material it's so hungry you've got to come up with an every day you've got to have a new phone in you've got to have interesting things to say you've got to read it lead a reasonably interesting life to comment about what's going on you've got to keep up with the news and the thing is really so hungry for material that you'll yeah. take you'll, you'll steal from anywhere just to get something on the next morning show and so i used to listen to radio shows it started out i when i was in australia when i started in australia i used to subscribe to a thing called california air check and a guy called george jernak would record radio breakfast radio shows off the air i think just on a boom box i don't know how he did it and he would record them in different cities around america and then cut out the music so all you got was the presenters and he you, you could subscribe and he would send you a cassette once a month 
from, you know, and I was listening to The Grease Man and Kid Craddock and Howard Stern and, and, and all these Americans and stealing things here and there. Not, not necessarily always stealing bits, but that did happen. But I was often just stealing ideas and ways to approach things. You know, how they would, if there was a big TV show on the night before, like, say, the Super Bowl, and the way that they would deconstruct the halftime show on the radio show. And, oh, great. And then I would use that technique to deconstruct, say, the Brits or something that our audience had watched that the night before on TV. And that was oh. how I used to get it. Well, after a while, when the Internet came along, you could stream these shows from all over the world not just the US I was listening to once I got back to Britain when I was listening to New Zealand and Australia and South Africa and anybody in English Canadian American any any radio show and eventually those shows started putting podcasts out of their shows because they were the highlights and the best bits of that day's show. You didn't have to listen to like two hours or four hours worth of the show. You could listen to a 40-minute best-of piece every day. And so I, I came to podcasting that way. And I just, I, I, am, I wonder now, how did anybody else get there once it was established? Because I'm, I'm going back to like, you know, the late 90s when I was starting to listen to streamed yeah. audio and stuff. And then yeah. the best bits, which then went on to iTunes. So how did you get there? Yeah, I'm trying to think now, really, because it definitely, I definitely remember things like the Classic Tales podcasts being a thing that I experienced because my dad downloaded them from iTunes or something like that when I was a teenager. And it wasn't like, you know, you were on Spotify or, or Apple Music or something streaming things that were you know, had this sense of being a podcast that had new content out every week and had a brand and had presenters and they were maybe related to something in TV or related to, you know, comedians that you loved or whatever, which I think is now how I find podcasts. I just go onto my Spotify app and I Google, you know, I like this comedian. I'm going to see if he has a podcast or whatever. Or I hear something on BBC and go, well, that's going to be online somewhere. I'll just find it online and listen to it when I've got time. But Coming to it, I I really can't remember this this kind of connection between how I listen to them now and how I got into that. I think it must have been through my dad sort of illegally downloading things and like putting them onto yeah. my iPod when I was a kid and saying, <laughs> "Listen to this," yeah, um, which was probably it. But yeah, it's it's also funny. I will say that being in the Highlands, I I often say this to my friends that I'm about five years behind them because <laughs> I lived on this like little farm in the Highlands and didn't really have a laptop or a smartphone or whatever until like much much later than my friends did when they were living in cities. So um, I never know quite how uh, accurate my kind of timeline is compared to everybody else's. <laughs> Well, I mentioned how I was inspired by listening to presenters all over the world. Is there anything in spaces that comes directly from an inspirational podcast that you listened to and went, I like the way that was, that was clever how they used that. I'm going to nick that. I think this sounds so <laughs> big headed to say, but I honestly think that I, it, it was more original than that it was more like finding a, a space that there wasn't something in podcasting. Like a lot of the podcasts that I'd listened to had been interview style or maybe like investigative or, you know, they had like a topic and they would have guests that they would come on and they'd discuss a topic together. And, and it was not like, I was interested in narrative work, you know, I was yeah. interested in stories and like, yeah. I'd always listened to audio books, but those were stories that had already been written by someone and were being retold in a podcast format. What yeah. I wanted to make was a story that was for a podcast format and something that I didn't, I hadn't seen that before. And I think that comes from, you know, I worked a lot in film and theater before this anyway. So I think it was mainly, like I say, when all the theaters were shut, I wanted, I wanted something dramatic. I wanted yeah. something new and there wasn't that space anymore. So I wanted to find the space in sound which is very directly related to the concept of spaces. But I think annoyingly, um, I will say that the Tron Theatre, which is a theatre in Glasgow, um, ha put out like a month before we, re we released our series spaces, put out a really, really similar series to that, which was with way more established playwrights 
like Steph Smith and stuff like that. And they put out audio plays that had like really rich sound design in them. And it was designed to listen through headphones and have this immersive the theatrical experience. And I was like, that's what we're doing. You just did it faster <laughs> because they had more money. And, they're in the and annoyingly, with them being a theatre, they probably had an email list of exactly. regulars that they could tell to download it. Where if yeah. you're starting off from, I mean, I don't know if Baker Street Productions, have, I'm sure they have some contacts, but surely not as big as an established theatre who have regulars who go and members and all that. Yeah, it's funny you should say it, it's, it's because the weird thing about, well, I've only heard the one episode, the positive. The weird thing about that is it is theatrical and I, I see the influence of cinema, but I think it's got more in common with great radio because it's very, very intimate. You're hearing somebody's thoughts and... There are very few characters in it. You know, if there's a lot, if there's lots of characters, if there's a big cast, sometimes because you haven't got the visual, it's hard to follow who's who. Uh, e even in the arches, it's hard to know what yeah. the hell's going on. Um, uh, but but in this, it is very personal and very intimate, which is what traditionally radio is good at. Um yeah. And that that's so so there must have been some kind of radio influence as well. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, it's hard to know because obviously it was a kind of writing project as well. And we were working with really emerging writers. And I think the easiest format when you're establishing a story with a new writer and you're giving peer support and that kind of creating new work it's kind of easier to do monologue, you know, it's kind of easier to have one character where you're, where you're telling a story. And especially in, in, if they're choosing a space that is intimate, like in the positive, we're in a bathroom, that's yes. a really intimate space. So it's kind of like the juxtaposition of finding a story that is kind of organically told for a new writer, something that's quite personal, um, something that like works with minimal cast. They, do, they don't have too many characters and don't have to worry too much about plots. You know, they can really focus on details and like character. And so it's a really good writing tool for when you're starting out to just start with a monologue. Yeah. Um, but it's also that the influence of that space and saying, yeah, you want, you chose a really intimate space. And there's other um, uh, episodes in spaces, uh, the one that's set in the car, for instance, that it's dialogue all the way around and they move right. a lot. They're in a car, so they move in different spaces and there's kind of... It's still, not there's got to be a limited number of cast because there's only as many people as can fit into exactly. a car. Yeah, it's still exactly. four's not exactly. a lot, you know, compared no. to a stage no. show. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was definitely, I mean, there was definitely a, a kind of influence of radio in it, I imagine. It really depends on the writer as well. You couldn't say. I mean, I I wrote one as well on on the project, so I think my one was probably influenced by radio, but I can't exactly pinpoint how. <laughs> I yeah. definitely listen to a lot of radio, and I've always been like a really avid audio consumer. So there must yeah. have been some influence, but I can't pin it. So tell me, you, you said there's lots of people involved because, like, and, and I said this in my review, like, there's no part of it is, is weak. Like no part. I mean, I don't. That sounds horrible. But like, the sound design is excellent. Okay. The the way that the you just just the small things. Like it's in a bathroom, so they've put echo on it. But it's the right kind of echo, mm -hmm. and the, the music that that goes with it is perfect. And the writing is perfect. And the performances from the actors, although there's really only one main one, but there's the, there's others in there. They're really well. So it was it was really well directed as well. Uh, so tell me about some of the other people that were involved. Yeah. So the positive specifically, um, that was written by Ailey Nurse, and she's an uh, emerging writer. She's from Dumfries um, and currently working down in London. Um, she's written a couple of plays before, but this was uh, the first project that I'd ever worked with her on. And she's a super talented playwright. I think she's going to go really far. Um, so she did, you know, she just had a really good concept, a really good grasp of what what would work in that space and in this medium, um, which was quite brave for her because she'd never written for audio before, as far as I'm aware. So she came into it completely kind of like willing to try something new for an audio space. And then um, we had an, a really great actress on it called Leah Byrne, who is the main actress. There's also Annie was supporting cast. And um, 
Leah's also trained in Glasgow and she's fantastic. Um, I can't stop smiling because I think the team that was put together on the, across the whole of the series was just like really, really good. I'm really proud of everything that they've managed to achieve. Um, and then our sound designers were complete finds. Like I'd never worked with them before. We just put a call out. We said, this is the concept. Like, do you want to have a go? Do you want to have a play? Um, so I think from my recollection, it was Adam Forbes that worked primarily on this, but we had two sound designers that worked across all of the episodes. So Adam Forbes and Dylan, Dylan McLaren, and I'm just trying to get people's names right. And, um, they kind of worked as a tag team a little bit. So one, they would take ownership on, on one specific um, piece and then kind of feedback from each other. So I think that help, that support from, from them was really helpful to give like a really rich, like detailed sound design. And that's what always what I was looking for from the start. I was like, we're making work for audio. So it needs to be interesting in terms of audio. We need to have great sound designers. And I think we just found some absolute gems. Um, so yeah, and then the music was by Rosie Wilson. She's a composer. Um, she's still working in Glasgow as well and across Scotland. And she's always had, I've worked with her before and she's always had amazing uh, music. So I was like, I knew that I wanted to work with her again. So yeah, it was kind of a mashup of people I'd worked with or people I'd seen absolutely open calls, new finds. Um, yeah, it was good. And there was a lot of kind of peer support and like review and feedback. So it really was like a complete team effort, I think. Um, Did and people get paid? Yeah, people got paid a kind of basic rate. It was yeah. definitely not the correct industry um, standard. If we would have had more money, I would have loved Well, it's to. in the middle of a pandemic and theatres are closed. So any port in a storm, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think like, you know, we were really transparent with people from the start. We were like, it's not, it's a token fee rather than like an actual hour, hourly rate that you're going to be working on this. And it's kind of, I hope, testament to like the idea and the quality of the writing as well that they wanted to work in that way. Um, so I'm really grateful for people for doing, for kind of taking taking a bit of a financial cut and, and creatively running with it. Yeah. I'll check out the rest of the Spacer series, but at the moment I only know about the positive and I don't know why I was only sent that one. I don't know why I wasn't sent yours. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, anyway, totally but, but what I got from it is like, because I don't normally listen to, for want of a better expression, drama as mm. audio only even though I read audiobooks, which sounds mad. The only time I'm exposed to it, when it comes on, I turn it off. And that's because it's the archers. Like, I love Radio 4, because one of the things I love about Radio 4 is you can listen to it, and simultaneously it makes me feel really smart and really stupid at the same time. You know what I mean? I think, oh, I'm listening to a thing about oh, the Bosnian crisis from whatever it is. And then I'm like, wow, I don't know anything about this. I know, you know, it, it does that. But then it, 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 you know, jogs along and then there's a science show and then there's, you know, some topical news and then da 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 da, -da <laughs> right? First of all, it's got terrible music. Da 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 da. I mean, it's just a joke, right? The, the, the acting I can I can hear them reading. It's almost like they should leave the sound of the pages turning in because it's so terrible. The sound design is almost non-existent except for some really clunky old sound effects, which I think they do a lot of them live. But it's yeah. just terrible. And I can't work out why it's so iconic. I can't listen to it. What yeah. do you think of the state of audio-only drama that is out there? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely why I felt like, like I said before, there was a bit of a hole in it because the only yes. audio only drama I've ever come across is from is on the BBC. And yeah, of course, you've got big running, long running series like The Archers. I actually listened to a podcast about The Archers from right. I think Guardian Long Reads about how it was the most successful sitcom in like history. Yes. <laughs> um, and they kind of analyzed why that was and, and what, what kind of pull it had. It was really interesting. You should check it out. But um, yeah, there's there's also, there's a slot, I think, I can't remember exactly the time, but they do like kind of short plays or like yeah. uh, little kind of dramas on BBC. It's in the afternoon. And I always remember listening to them, like, especially when I was at home, um, you know, in the summer holidays or something at school. And I remember them feeling really 
the overwhelming overwhelming feeling was kind of melancholy like i always wanted to switch them off because i was like this is so sad or like this makes oh me it's feel tragedy really... porn most of it yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and i was like i don't where's the where's the humor like where's the <laughs> different where's the different stories from different parts of the uk as well they all seemed like incredibly english home counties um, they're all set in the home yeah, counties yeah exactly <laughs> and i was like i want some glaswegian comedy it's, or, like, it's middle class people in the home counties all yeah. of them yeah, yeah. There's, there isn't a plumber from preston or something it's yeah. never you know it's or, or, or scotland or no, he's yeah. not very happy. He's not a very happy no. common person. <laughs> and I guess, like, you know, it is hard to write, especially for for audio. I think it's hard to write comedy because you don't have those visual like cues and, and the visual gags. But that was actually the first series that, that I did with Baker Street um, was called Speak of the Devil. And I kind of mentioned it earlier. It was uh, six plays and it was all written by emerging female writers. And the focus on that was meant to be comedy. It was meant to be kind of like, topics that were a little bit taboo or a little bit maybe um you know not that interesting but we make them interesting by adding adding humor and adding comedy and um it was basically a lot of like kind of outraged young women <laughs> getting getting kind of outraged through um through storytelling um there was one the one that got picked up by bbc radio scotland was called hair suit and it was all about female body hair and and okay. when you're going swimming and the writer for that one just absolutely tried as far as she could to take the mick for putting like, how many words can you put in for different kinds of body hair in this? And it's literally <laughs> like, it makes you kind of squirm sometimes, but it also makes you laugh so much. And the character is really like likable and really kind of sweet. Um, and it's that's one set, like I say, in a swimming pool. So again, the sound design for that is like really rich and interesting. and. The sound designer on that was called Alison de Klerk Mattis, and she's working in Canada now as, as in the film industry as a sound designer. But she was like, just took this idea and absolutely played around with it, and it's so funny. But and I think you know it got, did get played on the radio, but I don't imagine how it would get played on BBC Radio Four in the, like four <laughs> in the afternoon because <laughs> yeah. I think like yeah. it's kind of shocking, but in a funny way, um, yeah. which was the point of it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think well, there is it's. A I, I think it's great that you're involved in this because I, you know, I love audio and I've been working in audio for so, so long and, and some of what I do here annoys me and for you to come at it from this, this other approach with this, I don't know, that you must have the mindset of quality and, and whatever. You're not, you're not, I think some of those Radio 4 things, I think because it's Radio 4 and these people have a name, I think they're just phoning it in. But I, I'm so glad you're there actually, you know, doing it and the, the great people you've been working with I don't know if you've been lucky or whether you can spot talent. I don't know which, what, what is it, but either way it works. And if the positive is, is anything to go by, I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of Spaces. Uh, Anna Wheeling, what's next for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I hope more stuff in audio. At the moment, I'm not, um, I'm working in a bit of theatre. I'm doing a bit more writing myself. Um, I'm on a program at the moment with Scottish Youth Theatre and Playwright Studio Scotland, which is great. And that's a year long. So we're in this kind of workshop stage. And then the next half of the year, I have to write something intense, uh, intensely long and serious. Well, not serious in content, but serious in um, <laughs> it's going to be an actual thing. So that's what I'm going to be doing and focusing on for a bit. And then hopefully getting back more into writing and hopefully producing as well for audio. Um, I think it's such a flexible thing to do. And I really love I really love working with people where they have skills that I don't have, which is definitely sound designers. Um, I love being like, and, and composers and saying, you know, things like, can you make it sound a little bit like this? Or I don't really know what I want, but I kind of want it like to sound like you're sitting in a bath and crying and you've just eaten a massive curry. Can you do that? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you're like, how, how can, how can you un even understand what I'm saying right now? So yeah, I love that collaborativeness and I really, think it has such a rich place in audio drama um and i hope that yeah i hope that the industry can kind of support that a lot more as well and there are people who can pick things up and take shows that are made on a shoestring budget like ours was and 
get them get more people listening to them so yeah thank you so well, much for this opportunity as well because this has been great to talk about it it was actually quite a while since i've thought about <laughs> the project because it was made a while ago now but yeah it's been great Where did that word come from? I don't know. Bet you never thought you'd hear that on the radio.